Daisy telling us everything about the standard model and what else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm happy to get this uh, impossible task this morning. <laughs> so uh, I was asked to sp speak about the standard model and uh, small extensions. Actually, the standard model is strong interactions where the whole school is about, so uh, I will be extremely brief on that. Then uh, electroweak interaction, mixing in the quark sector, I will uh, speak a little bit on the neutrino sector, and uh, I will speak about the standard model of cosmology. Okay, so what is the standard, what, what do we call the standard model? So the standard model describes the interactions of elementary particles. So actually we, we have in nature four interactions, which is electroweak, which is, as you see later, in principle two separate, uh, two separate interactions that mix. We have strong interactions and we have uh, gravitation. Gravitation in daily life seems to be the most important <coughs> part that we experience. However, this cannot be at all included in the standard model. So uh, if you learn about the standard model, gravitation simply doesn't exist. Uh, apart from that, the model describes uh, successfully basically all data. However, we think that, uh, however, the model has many problems, so we think that it cannot be the final theory. So uh, every test of the standard model that you see, you should uh, understand as an attempt to uh, find its limits and finally to falsify it and see where one can go beyond it. Okay. Uh, when you talk about standard model, clearly you have to talk about uh, gauge theory because elementary particle physics is described by so-called uh, local gauge theories. So the general re recipe of that is you take a gauge group G, so and then uh, the interactions or the gauge bosons of this uh, of this theory are given by the generators of the group. So you have a strict mathematical correspondence between the structure of the theory and the structure of the forces that, uh, that this, that this uh, gauge group will uh, give you. The uh, fermions are arranged in uh, multiplets on which these uh, gauge bosons uh, act. And uh, the gauge group of the standard model is uh, the same as SU, SU3 cross SU2 cross SU1, where uh, SU3 describes the uh, strong interactions and SU2 cross U1, the uh, electroweak interactions. And again, gravity is not included in the model. At the, at the moment, in this scheme, all particles are, have to be massless. But of course, you know particles are not massless. But then masses can be generated by a breaking of the symmetry. So uh, just have a look at the uh, particle content in the uh, standard model. <coughs> So uh, fermions exist in uh, three families, and uh, these families are identical apart from their uh, masses. Leptons only have electroweak interactions, and the quarks also have a strong interaction. I think you basically you know you know all of the three families: uh, the, the, the neutrino electron with the UND quark, the muon neutrino muon with the CNS quark. Uh, tau neutrino and tau with the T and B quark. Uh, the interesting, but the interesting thing really to look at is also this, uh, this huge differences in masses. Even if you forget about the neutrino masses, you see, uh, you see some six orders of magnitude if you go from the electron to the, to the top quark. This masses is the only difference between the families we know of and we have absolutely no idea at the moment where this is uh, coming from. So, uh, Electroweak uh, interactions are mediated by the uh, electroweak uh, gauge bosons, and the gauge bosons we have is for the charge current, the W, with a mass of around uh, 80 GeV, <coughs> the neutral current, the Z, with a mass of uh, 90 GeV, and the photon, which is uh, massless and gives rise to the long known uh, QCD. So the gauge group is SU2 cross U1, so you have two two groups, so you have two independent couplings, usually called G and uh, G prime. And now the fermions exist, so, so you see as SU2 cross U1, so you need, you need doublets for, uh, for this, you need singlets for this. So the fermions exist actually as left-handed doublets 
and has right-handed singlets, where then the left-handed doublets, so the left-handed fermions which exist in the doublet, uh, interact with the SU2, while the, uh, while the right-handed fermions only interact with, uh, with the U1. So now for the SU2, you have three gauge bosons, W plus, W0, W, w minus. Uh, W0 doesn't appear here, I come to that on the next transparency, which are coupled to the left-handed doublets only. And uh, the U1 has a gauge boson B, which couples to the left and right handed fermions. And also, all these particles, especially the B and the W0, at this point have, uh, no, have no mass. Now you have to give ma uh, masses to the particles, which, is, which you do with the uh, uh, Higgs mechanism. So you have a complex Higgs doublet phi. And uh, the important thing now is you give this Higgs mechanism, you give this Higgs doublet, you give a vacuum a vacuum expectation value. So you give this, uh, you give this uh, Higgs doublet a potential which doesn't vanish at, uh, at zero, but which uh, has its uh, minimum <coughs> at a different place. And this, uh, so this potential, uh, V of phi, is lambda times phi phi star minus V squared over half uh, and all this squared. And you see now the, uh, the, minimum, the minimum of this potential is no longer at zero, but the minimum of this potential is at uh, is at V, so the, at uh, sort of the zero V, so it's a doublet and uh, it's arranged in a way that the minimum is here in this uh, neutral com component. Well, actually, the minimum in, in principle is, is a circle, but uh, this is what you call spontaneous symmetry breaking. Nature chooses uh, to have the minimum to, to have the minimum here. The, the value of this minimum is uh, 246 GeV. This is extremely precisely known from uh, from a muon case. And now uh, gauge bosons acquire their mass by coupling at this uh, at this gauge field. You see, this gauge field is a is a is a doublet, so it has SU2 and it has U1 interactions. So the uh, gauge bosons couple at this uh, at, uh, with this gauge field. They get their mass from the gauge field, and you see this from the Higgs field, and you see this Higgs field is a complex doublet, so it has four degrees of freedom. But now, uh, but now if you have a massless if you have a massless gauge boson, a massless boson like a photon has only two degrees of freedom. Uh, it can have a, uh, it, it has a transverse polarization, either of plus one, either of uh, minus one. It cannot have a longitudinal uh, polarization. But now uh, a massive gauge, uh, a massive boson can have this longitudinal polarization. So a massive boson has one degree of freedom more than uh, uh, than a neutral boson. And so you just uh, you just absorb this uh, three of this. Uh, Four degrees of freedom into the longitudinal components of the W plus, the W minus, and uh, uh, and the Z. The photon stays massless, so you have uh, you have one degree of freedom left, and this one degree of freedom left then is this uh, is a neutral scalar particle, the so-called Higgs particle, where we are all uh, looking for. Uh, you can also generate the fermion masses with uh, with the Higgs field by just uh, writing down uh, ad hoc uh, Yukawa couplings of the fermions to the Higgs field. And uh, the important thing in the standard model is if you want to write down a fermion mass term, it is uh, m times psi left bar times psi right. So you couple left and right-handed uh, particles to each other. So you see you see here <coughs> explicitly how. Uh, how a mass term breaks the symmetry with which you started, because you started with a with left-handed with a left-handed doublet for the S uh, that was only coupling only coupling to the uh, SU2 and then the right-handed singlet, and uh, you explicitly mix the gauge structure of the uh, of the fermions with uh, uh, with the mass term. Okay, uh, so what happens now to our W and B? So they are who are both neutral particles in the beginning, so they can uh, they can mix. So you get the usual mixing of two particles. The so Z is W zero times uh, cosine of some angle minus B times the sine of some some angle, and the photon is just vice versa. W zero uh, the sine of the angle plus B times the cosine of the angle. But now uh, but now the photon you want to uh, okay I call this already photon. Here you want to get back the photon, so you want to get massless particle you want it with a, with a pure vector coupling and uh, this you can arrange if you arrange the mixing angle in the right way uh, so actually if you have g times sin theta <coughs> equal to g, uh, 
to a G prime times cos theta, and this then is the coupling structure of the photon, and you know the coupling structure of the photon is equal to the elementary charge. So this means you finally uh, you start with uh, two free coupling constants and one mixing angle, but uh, the requirement that you uh, that you uh, get back your uh, well-known photon from QED uh, uh, determines one of the three uh, one of the three parameters by this uh, by this equation. So what are your resulting interactions? So the W's stay purely left-handed as they were before. The uh, photon is left-right uh, is a left-right symmetric pure vector coupling that you know from the uh, Maxwell e equations. But now the Z is a complicated mixture of left and right-handed couplings because uh, because the Z has to restore from the SU2 cross U1 prediction what is left over from the photon. But now the photon doesn't, uh, the photon doesn't uh, have any actual vector coupling, so the actual vector coupling stays to be at G half, so it stays to be as a, exactly at the same value as it would be without mixing. But uh, since the photon is stealing some of the vector coupling from the, from the Z, the vector coupling now of the Z is G half times 1 minus 4 Q sine square, uh, sine square theta. And at this place, a small remark on uh, neutrinos. So uh, neutrinos are e electrically neutral. So you see, you put here a uh, so you put here a, a, a zero. So the z coupling is a v minus uh, is again a v minus a coupling. The actual uh, actual and vector couplings are uh, equal. So it is a pure left. Also, the z coupling of the neutrino is uh, uh, is a pure uh, is a pure left-handed uh, pure left-handed coupling. Therefore, the w coupling you know already is pure left-handed. So this means uh, right-handed neutrinos actually would be, would be sterile. They would have absolutely uh, no interactions. OK, let me show, show a few slides on the, uh, on the Higgs. So what do, we actually, uh, what do we actually know about the Higgs? So you have seen in the standard model, there is exactly one free parameter <coughs> left. This, uh, there was this, this uh, overall normalization of the Higgs field lambda. The, uh, vacuum expectation value we know already from, from the muon decay. And, uh, but uh, the, the mass of the Higgs is uh, 2 lambda d square. So you see the mass of the Higgs is a free parameter in the standard model. But on the other hand, once you, once you know the mass, d you know already. So once you know the mass, you know lambda. So once you know the mass, you know everything about the Higgs. So once you have measured the mass, there are no, uh, there's no freedom anymore. So uh, lab has, of course, searched for the Higgs. And from the lab searches, we know that the Higgs is heavier than something like 114 GeV. Uh, the important thing, uh, the Higgs couples to mass. So the Higgs, is, uh, the Higgs field gives masses to the particles. So the stronger the Higgs coupling, the higher the mass. So this means also the uh, partial width of the uh, of the partial width of the Higgs are proportional to the particle masses, but the Higgs also couples to massless particles uh, via, uh, via loops, which it turns out to be extremely important for the LHC. And you see here the, uh, the branching ratios of the Higgs, and you see once if the Higgs is too light to decay into gauge boson, it basically goes all into uh, BB bar, some 80 to 90%. And then, that's an interesting thing also for the QCD part of this school. You see tau tau is much larger than, uh, than CC bar. And if you compare the tau mass, it's roughly the same as a D mass. So, uh, but here is uh, almost an order of magnitude in between. The point is that you have to take actually the running masses at the Higgs mass to calculate this uh, branching ratio. And since the electroweak mass is basically stay constant, while the, ma uh, while the uh, quark masses are strongly running, the uh, CC bar is, uh, is uh, much rarer than the, uh, than the tau tau. And then you see that you also have a by far non-negligible coupling to blue blue, which goes via, uh, via a top blue. Of course, once you, uh, once you will get, uh, get above the threshold for uh, decays into, uh, into gauge boson pairs, it's basically all WW <coughs> and ZZ. And uh, one, uh, if you are high enough, top uh, top, top uh, TT bar also plays, plays some role. And also, if you look then at the total width of the Higgs, the Higgs is an extremely narrow particle as long as you are below the uh, WW threshold. And then the, uh, and then the width really shoots up and 
if you are at a, uh, at about a TEV, the Higgs is almost as wide as heavy because the mass, go, uh, the width, go, uh, the width here grows with uh, the mass to the third power. Uh, if you talk about the Higgs, you uh, have to talk also about the hierarchy problems, which, uh, which uh, many people, uh, many uh, theorists consider as one of the most serious problems in the pure standard model. If you have a final theory, the final theory should be valid up to should, uh, up to the Planck scale. So the Planck scale is roughly speaking the scale where the gravitation becomes as strong as electroweak interactions, where you can so that means you can no longer uh, ignore gravity in, a, in any theory. So at this at this this is the latest place where any model without gravity has to break down. But if the model should be valid. Uh, but the model then should at least be valid up to the Planck scale, which is something like uh, 10 to the 19 GeV. But now you can uh, you can also you can also take the attitude <coughs> to define your parameters all at the Planck scale and run them down to the weak scale and then look at the physics at the weak scale. But now, uh, if you define them at the Planck scale and you run them down to the weak scale, you have to consider this sort of uh, radiated corrections where you have, a, for example, a Higgs running in that. Uh, Splits into, for example, a TT bar pair, and then it gets back to a Higgs. And these radiative corrections for the Higgs are extremely strong. So the uh, the delta, so the, the change in the mass that you would get from the radiative radiative correction on the Higgs is of the order of the Planck mass. So uh, this means you get radiative corrections in the order of 10 to the 19 GeV. However, the Higgs cannot be 10 to the 19 GeV because the Higgs mechanism only works if the Higgs is lighter than 1 TeV. For example, if you look at uh, WW to WW scattering, this violates unitarity of, uh, at uh, 1.2 TeV if you don't have a light Higgs. So you see, you, you start with uh, uh, your natural Higgs mass because of the radiative corrections is 10 to the 19 GeV. You, uh, you, uh, your uh, mechanism only works if the Higgs is below 1 TeV, uh, so 10 to the 3 G T, uh, TeV. TV. So, uh, so you have to do a fine tuning uh, with 16 with 16 digits to make the uh, to make the Higgs uh, to make the Higgs mechanism working at all. And this is of course considered as an extremely serious problem if you have a theory that you have to fine tune fine tune to to 16 significant digits that the theory is working at all. <coughs> okay, for strong interactions, as I said already, I will be extremely brief because uh, this is basically the rest of the school. So, uh, the strong interactions act only on quarks. The gauge groups is uh, the gauge group is uh, SU3. So, uh, quarks has, have to come in triplets of uh, three colors. And just show you one uh, one plot that I, that I like. This three colors is not something some abstract mathematical concept, but these three colors is a, real, uh, is a real degree of freedom of the quark. And if you talk about u quark, you actually have to talk about three different sorts of u quarks. And, if you talk, and, uh, and that you can see for here in this, this, uh, this uh, famous R plot, where you just got the, uh, the cross-action ratio with plus and minus to quarks over a plus and minus to, to muons. And uh, if you, and uh, for muons, you know the cross, you can calculate the cross section very well, and also for quarks, the cross section, the ratio for a single for a single fermion species to the muons is just the charge square of this uh, of this uh, fermion. And if you if you now just add up the quarks that you know, for example, here above the epsilon, you add up the five quarks with their uh, charge square, you uh, you uh, you get a, a you get a ratio that is a factor of three too small. So actually, this this factor three in colors, you have to add, you have to multiply in here to get the correct ratio of the uh, of the uh, hadron to the uh, to the muon cross section. And I think that and this plot on its own shows you already that uh, that this three colors is a real degree of freedom. So you really have to, uh, three different types of quarks, although you cannot uh, distinguish them uh, in in, uh, in daily life. And the exchange exchange particles are eight massive uh, uh, eight mass, uh, massless uh, nuance. Okay, when you talk about QCD, another thing that I would like to mention briefly, because it's also important for our concept of uh, particle physics and especially extrapolation to high state at all, is the uh, running of coupling constants. Due to uh, vacuum polarization effects, 
the coupling constants depend on the momentum transfer, so the constants is not even a good word for it. So if you have uh, gauge boson fermion interactions, you have uh, uh, screening, so the coupling constants fall with uh, falling energy, while if you have uh, gauge boson self interactions, you have an enhancement, so the coupling constants rise with uh, falling energy. So uh, this means at uh, electroweak interaction, where you basically have for example, in QED, you have no gauge boson self interactions at all. So, uh, the electro, so for electroweak uh, interactions, the constants are well behaved <coughs> if you go with uh, Q square to, uh, to zero, and you have something like order of 10% changes between, let's say, uh, zero and uh, 100 GeV. While in uh, QCD, the gauge uh, boson self interactions actually dominate, so the constant. Uh, so the coupling constants rise when you uh, go with Q squared to zero, and actually you get, uh, uh, you get a divergence uh, at, uh, at this place. So uh, this has some uh, immediate consequences. Quarks only, uh, only can exist in uh, color neutral states, so as uh, quark anti-quark pairs, which we call mesons, or with uh, three quarks or uh, three anti-quarks, which we call uh, variants. This whole mechanism is uh, usually called uh, confinement. And the second, uh, the second thing is now if you go in, in the other direction, if you go with Q squared to infinity, your, uh, your uh, coupling constant gets smaller and smluller. So sort of free quarks and gluons can, are visible only at uh, high energy, which is called asymptotic freedom. And I think our next uh, talk is about jets in it plus and minus, which is exactly uh, exactly that relation <coughs> of this uh, asymptotic uh, freedom. And you see here the, the variation of the uh, strong interact of the, uh, of the strong coupling constant as a function of the Q square. And this actually is a, is a very strong test of QCD where it is described uh, so well. And you see that, uh, that uh, we are not talking anymore about 10% effects, but we are talking about something like a factor of three if you go from high energy to a few GB, and here this thing is, uh, is simply diverging. Okay, let me come now in some more details on the two uh, ex experimental tests of uh, electroweak interactions. I have shown you that uh, the gauge sector actually is fully determined by uh, three parameters, these two coupling constants, let's uh, say G, G prime, and, and the vacuum expectation value V. In practice, this, uh, however, people usually don't use uh, these three parameters, but uh, to do calculations, you like to use the, you use the parameters that are experimentally best known, because then you get the smallest uh, errors for your predictions. And, uh, and uh, so the fine structure constant uh, alpha at zero, <coughs> the Fermi constant, so basically the uh, muon lifetime, and the mass of the Z are the three parameters that are best known. So this usually serves as the basis for all the calculations, and then you do, uh, and then you do predictions in uh, in terms of these three parameters. And now, if you have measured more than these three parameters, if you may, uh, you can actually uh, you can actually now test the model. So if you now measure other parameters like uh, the vector coupling of the Z, the actual vector coupling of the Z, the mass of the W, or whatever parameters you can imagine. You can predict these parameters in terms of the, uh, of the ones here that you have. You can measure them, you can, you can compare the prediction with the measurement, and you can, actually, you can actually test the model and see if your model really describes, uh, really describes the data. You expect, of course, one loop corrections to be in the order of alpha, so which means in the order of uh, 1%. And uh, especially at LAP, we have, uh, we have done precision measurements which are more than an order of magnitude better than this uh, 1%. So you have to take into account uh, loop correction if your precision is uh, better than that. And these loop corrections have some important effects now of the test. I think in some sense, the tests really get a completely new quality if you test the, if you test the model on the loop level or if you test it only on the board level. Because first of all, in the loops, you have particles running that are nowhere, uh, nowhere in your process. So your uh, loop corrections get sensitive to other parameters, which in, in principle you don't see, like the top mass or the Higgs mass. You test the model really at the quantum level, so you test much more of the model 
because all the gate structure, everything enters in this, uh, in this loop corrections. And also, uh, when you have parameters here entering that you don't see, also parameters from new physics which you don't know about can enter. So all these tests now even can get sensitive to, uh, to physics at higher scale, which you are not yet uh, sensitive to. So which are the uh, electroweak observables that we are uh, testing? Okay, the fermion sector is completely known. When I say completely known, uh, of course, the neutrinos are still unknown to a large extent, but, uh, the, uh, but the neutrino masses are completely irrelevant in the context of the uh, electroweak uh, precision test. I said uh, alpha and GF are already known with very good precision, and uh, many observables can be measured on Z resonance. I come to that on the next experiments. The W mass is measured also now with uh, very good precision at LAP and at the Tevatron. You see here, for example, from, uh, from Opel, the reconstruction of, uh, of, the w, uh, of the W resonance at LAP2, and you see that you perfectly understand your resonance shape, and if you average all data, you get from this sort of uh, analysis a precision of the, uh, on the W mass in the order of 30 MeV. And then there are some other uh, observables like atomic parity violation, low energy well scattering, and so on, that give you some additional information. Let me come now a little bit more to the observables on Z resonance. One of the most important measurements is certainly the, uh, the scan of the resonance itself. So uh, from, okay, the, the red curve, this is the, this is the lab one, uh, the, the lab one scan, which really gives the precise information. The other, the, other, the other points are from, uh, from that 2 or from low energy plus and minus collider, which just shows you how extremely well this uh, plus and minus to uh, hard rock cross sections is uh, understood by now. But here from the, peak, uh, from the scan of the resonance itself, clearly you get the peak position, so you get the mass of the, uh, of the Z with extremely good precision. You can get the uh, width of the curve, so the width of the Z, and of course you can also measure the height, so you can measure the total cross section, which uh, gives you, uh, which gives you uh, some input to the partial width of the Z. So uh, other observables apart from the Z, so you measure the uh, partial and total, you measure partial width, you measure total width, you measure uh, symmetries, and of course uh, you can express everything in terms of the coupling of. Your, your process is the plus and minus couples to a Z, and then the Z decays into two fermions. So clearly you can uh, express everything in terms of the uh, uh, couplings of the Z to the fermions. And for the couplings you have two, you have the vector coupling and the uh, actual vector coupling. Okay, you can also write it at left and right handed coupling, but this turns out to be the uh, nicer way to, to write things uh, down. The uh, actual vector coupling, uh, I have shown you already, this was basically a measurement of, uh, of, the, of G, so this measures the uh, total normalization of the SU2 coupling constant, while the vector coupling actually is mainly sensitive to the uh, Z-gamma mixing. It, uh, this means the uh, weak mixing angle. I've shown you already this formula, V over A is uh, 1 minus 4 times the charge <coughs> times uh, times uh, sine square theta, so V over A actually measures, uh, the weak, uh, measures the weak mixing angle. The Z partial width now, for some numerical reasons, turn out to be uh, sensitive basically to, to, the, to the total normalization, so to the actual vector coupling constant. The reason for that is simple. If you have four quarks, the, uh, the charge is small, so uh, this, this term is suppressed. For uh, leptons, the, the charge is large, it's one, but then V over A gets very small, so uh, V is a small number. In the partial width, you, uh, the vector coupling enters as a square, so if you uh, square a small number, it gets even smaller, so it gets basically irrelevant for leptons. So this means the Z partial width basically measure the uh, total normalization of your uh, weak couplings. But then you have also all sort of symmetry <coughs> measurements, where you see, for example, here the VD uh, bar symmetry at SLD for left-handed for left-handed polarized beams and for right-handed polarized beams. And the nice thing now is this uh, this this symmetry. So you see, these symmetries are typically parity violating uh, parity violating uh, quantities, 
And uh, so this asymmetry actually measure the interference of the vector coupling to the, to the actual vector coupling. And, uh, the, and the interference usually now is now it's not squared, but it is linear. So uh, you so you basically measure this sort of this this sort of uh, so-called a parameter two times the vector coupling times the actual vector coupling divided by uh, by the by the square of the two. So uh, so this means so basically this symmetries v over a measure the uh, measure the weak uh, the weak mixing angle. So now I, I told you that uh, you that you measure much more precise than the, uh, than what the bond level can do. So you have to take into account uh, loop corrections, and so uh, you. Uh, but but then you start with some 15, 20, 20 quantities. So you want to get some structure into your uh, into your radiated corrections. And uh, what you find is that most Z observables and MW basically can be described with only three additional parameters, which is uh, one is uh, usually called delta rho, which is just the total normalization of the Z fermion coupling. Then your uh, effective mixing angle just gets modified, and you replace it by by an effective uh, weak mixing angle, and you have an additional. Uh, Additional parameter delta r, which then describes which uh, which describes the radiative corrections to get the W mass. The only uh, the only uh, exception from this uh, from this rule that you can describe everything with these three parameters is the uh, ZBB bar coupling, because the top quark is uh, is very heavy and you have some significant uh, significant corrections. That apply only to the only to the B quark because the B quark can split into a top and uh, and uh, a W, but this is well under control. So uh, for the understanding of the whole picture, you can more or less forget this. In the standard model, you have uh, although you have three different parameters, you have only two independent contributions. There is a very large term coming from the isospin splitting, which is, which is proportional to mt squared minus, uh, minus mb squared. And there is a much smaller term, which, come, which comes from the Higgs. And this term goes only logarithmic, basically <coughs> proportional to log mh over, uh, over mw. Very often, you see, instead of these three parameters, you, uh, you see a reparameterization in terms of uh, Either this uh, so-called epsilon parameters, epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, or uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, more popular, this uh, STU parameterization. But these are completely, completely equivalent. And uh, in, the nice thing of this reparameterization is to start with epsilon one or S, which is identical to delta rho. So this absorbs this uh, large, this absorbs all these large uh, isospin splitting corrections. And then in epsilon three, you basically take sine square theta effective, but you subtract the part that is already uh, you subtract the part that is, uh, that is proportional to uh, to this large uh, isospin corrections. So you are only sensitive to the much smaller logarithmic corrections. And then in uh, epsilon two or u, uh, this you need then only to describe delta r to describe the uh, to describe the w mass. So this parameter doesn't enter at all in the analysis of the Z observables. It only comes in once you go to uh, once you need the W mass. And since you have subtracted already these corrections and these corrections in the standard model, this parameter is exactly constant or uh, zero in the STU case. And also, most extensions of the standard model don't give you anything in, the, in this uh, in this parameter. So now, once you uh, once you have all the all these uh, measurements, you can perform electroweak fits. So this means you just take the full standard model, you uh, <coughs> you vary the free parameters of the standard model, and you try to describe all your uh, all your data with it. And basically, uh, basically the only free parameter that we have in the standard model is the Higgs mass, where for technical reasons, you leave a few other parameters free in the fit to get your uh, to get your uh, 
error, to get your error description better under control, for example, the Z mass is left as a free parameter, but at the same time it is entered as a measurement. The same is true for the top mass, which is left as a free parameter, and at the same time it is uh, entered as a measurement and, uh, and some others. But basically, you have one free parameter, which is the X mass, and you fit the standard model for, uh, for this one free parameter. And first of all, the important thing is the overall fit quality is good. It has got a little bit of free, I mean 17.8 over 13. So this means the standard model, the standard model is able to describe all, the, uh, all, these, uh, all these measurements as a whole. And you see here the measurement, the uh, fit prediction, and then the uh, deviation of the measurement from the, uh, from the fit prediction in terms of sigma. And you see there is not a single measurement that is, uh, that is above three sigma. And there is one measurement, which is actually the B asymmetry, at the forward backward asymmetry for B quarks at left, which is in the region between two and three sigma. All the rest is uh, below two sigma. So the standard model is really able to describe this huge amount of, uh, of, uh, of data. And, uh, but now, the other important thing within the, uh, you have fitted for the X mass, we don't know the X mass, so you can, uh, you can see what does the standard model together with all this uh, high precision data uh, predict for the X. And uh, actually the standard model predicts that the X is light. So you see here uh, the, the chi-square as, as a function of the X mass. And okay, the band is an attempt to estimate the theoretical error that we still have. But uh, the important thing is the Higgs comes out to be light in the order of 100 GB, which is actually already in the excluded region. But this is no problem because you see the chi-square, uh, uh, the region where delta chi-square even is below, uh, below 1, extends well into the allowed region. So this is still perfectly consistent, uh, perfectly consistent with the uh, with the, standard, uh, with the standard model, and if you try to, if you try to get a sort of one-sided 90% 90 confidence level, you get a limit on the Higgs mass around 200 GeV. So this means, uh, within, if the standard model is correct, the Higgs mass has to be has to be lighter than 200 GeV. So uh, that, that's already an important message, for example, for the for the LHC because it tells you. Uh, where, uh, where primary to look for the Higgs. Uh, a side remark, although this doesn't belong to my talk, this, mark, this is also perfectly consistent with uh, supersymmetry, which where basically all the supersymmetry decouples, but the light Higgs is a firm prediction of the theory, so uh, for people who like supersymmetry, this is also another confirmation. <coughs> when, uh, of course, this limit is only valid within the standard model if you invent some sort of uh, extensions to the standard model that that are able that they give radiative corrections to your uh, to your uh, high precision data. Of course, this high, this uh, corrections of the of your model extension can exactly mimic uh, can exactly mimic a light Higgs. So, uh, if you have a model which gives uh, which gives significant uh, signals in the loop corrections, this uh, this Higgs mass limit isn't valid anymore. Okay, of course, this data can also be fitted with this uh, epsilon 1 to 3 or uh, STU uh, as uh, three parameters. Uh, of course, when you stay within the standard model, this simply shows again the <coughs> agreement of the data with the standard model. You see here the epsilon 3, epsilon 1 plane. This is, uh, this is the fit, and the yellow region is the standard model. So you see that for a light X, you are nicely within the standard model prediction. You see here also again what I meant with this uh, reparameterization. You see now that the top mass is exactly uh, in the uh, it's exactly at constant epsilon three, so only in the epsilon one direction. So this means this sort of isospin splitting corrections only affect epsilon one and not epsilon three. While the x now uh, is it uh, makes a contour in this uh, in this uh, plane. But uh, the important thing now is that this uh, epsilon parameterization also allows you easy interpretations uh, beyond the standard model. And for example, this uh, QCD-like uh, Technicolor models or little X models, a large part of the uh, parameter space 
can simply be excluded by this sort of plot because the prediction would come up would come up somewhere come out somewhere uh, somewhere here, and so uh, they are not uh, they are not consistent with the data. So this is a type of plot that really allows you very well to test models beyond the standard model. One slide on uh, gauge boson self couplings. Of course, you know, once you have uh, non-abelian theory, you get uh, couplings amongst, uh, amongst the gauge bosons, and these couplings amongst the gauge bosons are also uniquely defined by the structure of the gauge group. So this means, uh, means the measurement of these couplings actually probes the gauge structure uh, itself. So the WWZ and uh, WW gamma uh, couplings are usually described in terms of uh, five parameters. Unfortunately, at lab, where one has the best, uh, the best sensitivity, or up to now had the best sensitivity to, uh, to these uh, self polar gauge couplings, it is, since there are no polarized beams, it's uh, impossible to uh, separate the WWZ and WW gamma coupling because you have E plus E minus goes to WW and if in the propagator there was a photon or a Z you have no way to uh, you have no way to distinguish so you have no way to distinguish the, the Z and uh, gamma couplings so what people uh, do to circumvent these problems is they just assume from theory just some uh, some relations between the WWZ and WW gamma couplings, and so they can uh, <coughs> go from five parameters to uh, to uh, three parameters, but and then then fit for these uh, three parameters. But then, uh, if you are down to the three parameters, the uh, measurements uh, agree with the standard model on the uh, few percent level, which is uh, what, which what you can see here. You see here at 68 percent and 95 percent confidence level, the uh, the measurements at uh, the measurements at that for G1Z and lambda gamma, where uh, the central value should be here at uh, one zero, or uh, lambda gamma kappa gamma, the central value should be here at zero one. So you see that uh, it's nicely consistent with the with the prediction. And these gauge boson self couplings are known to something like uh, like a few percent now. Hadron colliders. At Hadron Colliders, you typically measure these couplings from the final state. So you look for a W gamma or for a WZ final state, so you can actually distinguish if it is a WWZ or WW gamma coupling. But uh, at present, the precision is not really competitive, but this will change with uh, the high luminosity Tevatron and then, uh, and then even more with uh, uh, LHC data dramatically. Okay, uh, unifications <coughs> of uh, gauge couplings. Of course, one of the uh, big questions we have is why do we have three or three, uh, three plus one forces in nature and not one? Ideally, we would have one force in nature and everything is described by that. And uh, there are the so-called uh, grand unified theories which actually assume that we have uh, one force at a uh, high scale and then by some mechanism uh, at a so-called gut scale this, uh, this high symmetry is broken and uh, the, three, uh, the, th uh, the three separate forces are uh, generated. Of course, if, at, uh, if you have one force at the very high scale, you run it down to the gut scale, and then at this gut scale, the thing breaks up into three different forces. It is uh, mandatory that at this, uh, that at this scale, all, uh, all forces have exactly the same value, otherwise it doesn't work. So uh, this requires the three coupling constants to meet at some point. But, uh, but if, you do the, if you now take the standard model at the low scale, run the coupling constant to the high scale, you see that they, uh, that they never meet. Of course, two curves always meet, but then the, th uh, then the third curve is, uh, is some distance apart. So the measurements are uh, precise enough to show that this grand unification is impossible within the standard model. Of course, when you, uh, you, if, you uh, uh, if you extend the standard model uh, by having some new thresholds, and at these new thresholds you introduce new particles, so the slope of your, uh, of your uh, uh, running changes, of course, if you, if you introduce new thresholds, you actually can, can force all the, uh, can force all the uh, couplings to, uh, to unify at some point. And for example, in supersymmetry, uh, 
this, uh, this happens relatively uh, naturally. So within supersymmetry, this uh, rank unification is still possible. But rank unification just within the standard model without new particle, without new thresholds slightly above is, uh, is not possible at all. Let me come now briefly to the quark sector. <coughs> so we know that quarks mix. This means the mass eigenstates are not equal to the, the weak eigenstates. So this looks in, in principle, you, you have, when, you, uh, when you describe all the systems, you can, you can rotate things largely around at will, so there is a lot of uh, arbitrariness in the game. And per construction, one puts the mixing only in the down quark sector. So per definition, for the up quark sector, the weak eigenstates and the mass eigenstates are the same. And then in the down quark sector, one puts, uh, one puts all this mixing matrix. So you have a mixing uh, so your mixing matrix now D prime, which is the down quark vector for the uh, weak eigenstate, is equal to some mixing matrix matrix times the uh, times the eigenvector for the for the mass eigenstates. And then this mixing matrix you can of course you can just write at this sort of element. And what is very popular is to write it in the so-called uh, in the so-called Wolfenstein parameterization, which is a parameterization which is valid up to uh, second order. So you clearly uh, see, recognize here the one minus lambda square half and uh, lambda here. So this is basically a two by two rotation matrix with sine of a mixing angle and uh, cosine of a mixing angle. But what you also see, this is a purely phenomenological thing, which, uh, but, it, uh, it's, uh, but this A is in the order of one. So you have here <coughs> lambda, you have here lambda squared. So the, uh, Mixing in the, uh, the mixing between the uh, S and the B quark is uh, suppressed by one lambda, so by roughly one order of magnitude compared to the mixing in the uh, between the, uh, the down quark and the uh, and the S quark, and the mixing between going over two separate uh, going over two generations, going from uh, so going from the B quark to the down quark, you even have a lambda a lambda to the third, so you get almost another order of magnitude. In the mixing from the uh, in the in the mixing from the B quark to the down quark, but this is all <coughs> this is all phenomenological. But there is no uh, there is no real explanation for it, and you will see that can be vastly different for the neutrinos. What is important is that this matrix contains uh, one non-trivial complex phase. You say which in this parameterization it's put here, and also in the in the B to uh, in the uh, B to D mixing, where you see this rho minus uh, I eta. So here is a complex number, and this complex number actually introduces CP violation into the standard model. So why is, it, why is CP violation important in the standard model? OK, uh, CP violation is a prerequisite to transform a symmetric universe into a meta-dominated universe. But after the Big Bang, we believe, is completely symmetric. So after the Big Bang, we have the same amount of matter and antimatter. <coughs> now we don't see uh, now we don't see an antimatter anymore anywhere in the uh, anywhere in the universe. So somehow this has to, uh, this has to have uh, disappeared. And of course, this can only happen if you have CP violation. If all if all uh, interactions are symmetric for matter and antimatter, there is no uh, no possibility to uh, create an asymmetry out of uh, out of the symmetry. <coughs> what is also important uh, within the standard model, we can have CP violation only if we have uh, <coughs> if we have at least uh, if we have at least three families. If you have only two families, you can write this uh, this, mat this uh, mixing matrix always so without uh, without a complex phase. So you don't, you, there's no place to put CP violation if you have only two families. But uh, so it looks like, hey, now here we have a very nice explanation why we need at least three families, because we are there, and uh, so we cannot have too much antimatter, and so we need three families to, uh, to get the CP violation. However, this, uh, this argument doesn't work, because the CP violation that you can generate with the CKM matrix simply is not sufficient to create the uh, observed barrier and symmetry. CP violation has been discovered in the K0 system long ago, and in recent years, also many CP violation effects have been, uh, have been measured in the B system. So this mixing matrix has to be unitary. So this means there have to be no, can, there cannot be any failure change in neutral currents. There are uh, six unitar so-called unitarity triangles. 
So this is just uh, this uh, sum i v i n by i n star has to be zero for m unequal to n. So uh, this is just uh, a reflection of this unitarity. And uh, the most interesting one is, uh, is this relation, which actually in this Wolfenstein parameterization measures uh, rho and eta. And the area of this triangle defines, uh, defines the p-violation. And so this, the measurement of this unitarity triangle then is basically the, the, main, uh, the main goal of this uh, p-factories where, uh, where one tries to measure all sorts of CP violation in the p-sector. So uh, there are many complementary measurements. So there are BDK rates, BD bar mixing, CP violation in the K-on system, several CP violating uh, measurement observables in the B system. And because it's so new and uh, interesting, I've just put, in, put here the first measurement of uh, BS, BS bar mixing at, uh, at the Tevatron, where you now see clearly, uh, okay, this is, this is a measurement of the amplitude of the, uh, the amplitude of the mixing if you assume the frequency. And if the mixing is, if you don't have this frequency that you have assumed, basically the mixing should be zero, so the amplitude that you measure should be zero. When, the, uh, when you are at the right frequency, uh, the amplitude should be one. And, uh, of, uh, and, uh, and so you see here at small mixing, the amplitude is zero within errors and one is excluded. If you are at the right frequency, the amplitude gets one and uh, zero is excluded. And then of course at some place the, error, the errors explode and you cannot say anything anymore. But you see here there is a region where the amplitude is consistent with, with one but is inconsistent with zero. So uh, actually this, uh, this analysis proves that the SDS bar mixing is there and this is the frequency that you, uh, that you have. And now each of these measurements defines a region in this, uh, well, this is again this unitarity triangle where you basically, uh, where you uh, normalize it that, uh, that, this, uh, that uh, this length is exactly, is exactly one. And then, uh, then uh, this point here is, uh, the, 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 this upper apex of the triangle is, uh, is, uh, rho, is rho and eta. And now each measurement that you, that you do in the, uh, in the quark sector actually finds a region in the in the row in the row eight eta plane. So you have for example here we have for example here the CP violation in the in the Kion sector. You have uh, you have here measurements like V you have the you have the uh, you have the CP violation in the B sector, you have the B B bar mixing and so on. And now, uh, and now you can uh, you can play the same game as you can as you have played already in the uh, for the electroweak fits. Basically, the combination of the uh, accurate measurements gives you a good measurement of uh, rho and eta, so it fixes the, uh, the leftover parameter in the CK matrix. But more important, again, uh, you can see if each measurement is individually consistent with this uh, combination, and in fact it is. And uh, the CK, this means actually now also that the CKM description of the, uh, of the quark sector Describes, uh, describes the data very well without any need for, uh, for physics beyond the standard model. So this means also our the quark flavor structure is, uh, is very well described by the standard model without any need for additional new physics. Okay, let me come now briefly to the neutrino sector. Then the master in the standard model is MCRCL. So the standard, uh, in the standard model, the neutrinos are massless. So this means right-handed neutrinos do not exist. However, we have seen, I come to it later, neutrino oscillation. From atmospheric neutrinos and accelerator neutrinos, we know that the muon and the tau neutrino mix. From solar and reactor neutrinos, we know that the electron and the muon neutrino mix. If you write down your uh, neutrino mixing frequency and amplitude, so the probability to go from, uh, from one neutrino to another is proportional to the sine square of the mixing angle and proportional to the sine square of the, uh, ma of the uh, mass difference square of the two neutrinos divided by the neutrino energy. So the important thing is there is a sine square delta, delta m square. So this means if neutrinos oscillate, they have to have mass. If all the masses are zero, of course the delta m square also is zero. So the sine is zero, so they cannot, uh, they cannot oscillate. And, uh, but on the other hand, you see that here is, the, here is uh, 
the uh, delta m squared, so only a mass difference. So this means uh, neutrino exper experiments are only sensitive to ma mass differences. They cannot measure absolute masses. But clearly, we have seen neutrino oscillations, and neutrinos must have mass. So uh, briefly, quantitative uh, results. So new E, new, new, new mixing. There are uh, solar neutrino experiments show that neutrinos tra transform away from uh, from new E on their way to the to the Earth. So you see here uh, uh, the neutrino rates that you get from uh, from the snow experiment in uh, from the snow experiment in Canada. And, you, and uh, this is the uh, rate of muon and tau neutrinos. This is the rate of electron neutrinos. If they don't, the sun <coughs> only generates electron neutrinos. Uh, you should have only electron neutrinos. But uh, you see that if you combine the different measurements, you have to have electron neutrinos and also uh, muon or tau neutrinos. So you have to have oscillations of electron neutrinos into muon and, uh, and tau neutrinos. And uh, some reactor experiments actually uh, also show the disappearance at uh, shorter distance, which is uh, consistent with that. And if you now combine the, uh, the, the two measurements, you get actually pretty accurate measurement of delta m squared, which is in the order of 10 to the minus 4 e volt squared, which means the mass of the electron and the probably muon neutrino has to be very uh, has to be very close to each other, and the mixing angle actually is pretty uh, is pretty large, but not uh, but not um, ma not maximum. Uh, similarly, for new new to uh, new tau measurement, uh, new new to new tau mixing, there are precise measurements from uh, from atmospheric neutrinos when you look at the new new mu over new e ratio from from uh, neutrinos that come from up, so they just come through the atmosphere. So this is a couple of kilometers, or you look for, neutri uh, for neutrinos that come from below, so that have also a couple of kilometers through the atmosphere, and then 10,000 kilometers to the Earth. So actually, so you compare, <laughs> so you compare this ratio for, for, for neutrinos that have uh, that have flown a few kilometers and neutrinos that have flown uh, 10,000 uh, 10, kilometers, and you clearly <coughs> see that this rate is uh, is extremely uh, is extremely uh, different. So, uh, so from this you find that, uh, so this is again the delta m squared versus, versus the mixing angle uh, contour, you find that the mixing is, is maximal, so sine squared to theta is about, uh, is about uh, 1, and the, uh, and the mixing uh, and the uh, mass difference squared is a factor of 100 larger than, for, than, it, was, uh, than it was in the uh, electron uh, muon separation. So uh, this is briefly the results that, uh, that one has. So the mixing matrix is pretty different from the quark sector. There are still two possibilities for the mass hierarchy. So this is the so-called normal hierarchy. So if we, uh, if we do the same, the same pattern that we have for the quarks or that we have for the charged electrons, if we assume that the same pattern is true for the, for the neutrinos, we have the electron neutrino, uh, so the, odd, so the like let's call it electron-like neutrino and the muon-like neutrino, and they have a, a very, they have a mass difference squared of eight, of uh, something like ten to the minus four, and at uh, ten to the minus uh, at uh, ten to the minus three, we have the uh, tau neutrino up here, and the different colors give you the mixing of the particle. And you see, especially this this uh, this guy here is an equal mixture of uh, all three neutrinos. So you cannot even say it anymore. This is a uh, muon-like neutrino. This is just a one third muon, one third electron, one third tau. But there is still the possibility, since you measure only mass different squares, that this ma that this hierarchy is inverted. That the two guys who are close to each other are actually the heavy one, and uh, the, and the other one is uh, the other one is the light one. That this this mass difference is in this order that we know because of matter effects in the sun, because the sun is not vacuum. The sun is full of matter and and there an electron neutrino uh, interacts different as a muon neutrino, so you know what is the lighter one, what is the heavier one, but these two possibilities we still have, we cannot uh, distinguish. So what is the nature of neutrinos? In principle, neutrinos can be normal Dirac particles, like in the standard model. The uh, tritium endpoint measurements uh, define then the mass of the neutrino to be less than two electron volts. Uh, this <coughs> is difficult to explain the large mass difference in the standard model. Uh, we started at 175 GeV for the top core. We have uh, 
500 MeV for the electron, and now we have 2 GeV for the neutrino. This is quite difficult to explain, but uh, we don't understand masses anyway, so this may not be a problem. However, there is also an alternative. It can be that neutrinos are by <coughs> particles, and then the small masses follow naturally from the seesaw mechanism. In the seesaw mechanism, you uh, mix a Dirac particle of uh, where the mass is in the, is in the order of a weak scale with a Majorana particle where the mass is in the order of the gut scale. So if you write down the mass matrix, you get that. And then if you just uh, solve for the eigenvalues, the smaller eigenvalue is MD square over M. So if you put here some, some weak masses, let's say a few GeV, and you put here the gut scale 10 to the 16 MeV, you come, uh, you come exactly in, this, uh, in the order of below, below the electron wall. So uh, this, uh, this would come out uh, very, ni very naturally. How can you actually prove that the uh, uh, neutrino is a Majorana particle? And there is only one interesting process that you can use, and this is the so-called neutrinoless double beta decays. There are some nuclei where a beta decay is, kinema is uh, kinematically forbidden, but a double beta decay, so uh, two beta decays in the same, uh, at the same time, is kinematically allowed. So if you have a nucleus, and uh, you, you, uh, you transform two neutrons simultaneously into protons, you, uh, you, end up with, uh, you end up with a nucleus that is lighter, or more than twice the electron mass lighter, than your daughter nucleus. So you can have two, two, uh, two beta decays at the same time. Of course, if you have the usual, the usual uh, double beta decay, so you emit in simultaneously two electrons and two neutrinos, this is a perfectly allowed thing in the standard model, so this decays uh, exist, uh, no, uh, no surprise. But you can also, uh, in principle, have this uh, neutrinoless double beta decay, where, okay, the two neutrons uh, emit a W and turn into a proton, but now the W splits into a, a neutrino and an electron. The neutrino gets absorbed here by the uh, by the other W and turns into an electron. So clearly, uh, this this <laughs> process is lepton number violating because you end up with two uh, with two uh, electrons. And, uh, but this is possible if this neutrino part, if this neutrino here is a Majorana particle. So basically, it's, it's its own uh, antiparticle. So on the <coughs> way here, it is generated as an antineutrino, and then it turns into a neutrino. So uh, this is uh, this is possible if it is Majorana. However, uh, if you look at the at the helicity, the electron uh, the neutrino also here has to flip its helicity. So uh, this is only possible if the neutrino has a, a, has a mass. So this means you this process you you can only uh, you can only prove that it is Majorana if the neutrino is uh, heavy enough and there are for example limits from uh, germanium 76 to selenium 76 and uh, and uh, from this you can follow that the neutrino has to be lighter than something like 0.4 e volt if the neutrino is a Majorana particle. So let me now come very briefly at the end to the standard model of cosmology, which shows you very nicely why the standard model by far cannot be all. Cannot be so the universe, the universe or originates from an initial singularity, something like 15 billion, uh, 15 billion years ago, and since then it uh, cools and uh, expands. And many features like, uh, like element production and so on are very well described by, uh, by this model. However, there are some features that don't fit together at all in the standard model. For example, you can measure the uh, anisotrop uh, uh, anis uh, isotropy of the uh, cosmic microwave background, and uh, especially this first this first peak here. So this peak is basically, if you look at fluctuations, and this is a sort of average average distance of the fluctuations in the microwave background. And uh, since you know exactly how these fluctuations have been created. The, uh, the distance actually sh uh, measures immediately the uh, geometry, the geometry of the, uh, the geometry of the universe, and from this you can deduce, from this position here, you can deduce that the universe, that the, uh, that the universe is, uh, is flat. Then uh, the matter that you need to get uh, the matter that you need to get a flat universe cannot be all baryonic. So from this you, you know that we have to have dark matter in the universe. We have to have matter that is not matter that is included in the standard model. 
And there are many more, many more pieces of evidence for dark matter. There are rotation curves along galaxies. There are patterns of galaxy clusters and further features of the cosmic microwave spec spectrum. So we know that we have to have uh, that we have to have non-baryonic uh, matter. From uh, things are getting even worse. For example, from the supernova explosion, one can see that the uh, that the expansion of the universe is uh, accelerating. So you look at supernova that are very far away. You know from the supernova 1A type, you know exactly their luminosity. So from the parent luminosity, you can, uh, you can deduce the distance. You can measure the redshift so they know how far they are, uh, they are expanding. And, you, and, from, and normally you would, uh, you, you, would, uh, you would assume that our universe, that the expansion is slightly slowing down because there is matter. The matter is, the matter is, uh, attracting each other, so the universe is somehow attracting, and so uh, the expansion has to slow down. But what you see from this is uh, just the opposite. The universe is even accelerating and not, uh, and not uh, slowing down. So, uh, so this, requires even, uh, this requires even a sort of dark energy or cosmological constant in the Einstein equation, so something that is even more, more bizarre for us uh, to describe. So if you put all these measurements uh, together, you find that uh, you find that our universe consists out of 74% uh, dark energy, 22% dark matter, and 4% uh, atoms. And now the whole lecture on the standard model that I just gave you is only dealing with this 4% uh, all uh, dealing with this 4% atoms. So in this one hour, I, co I, uh, I cover 4%, and 96% are still. Uh, are still completely uh, are still completely open. So uh, this means there has to be uh, there has to be something uh, beyond beyond the standard model that we don't uh, that we don't know yet. So uh, what do we know about uh, dark matter? We know that uh, from we know that it has to be weakly interacting particles with a mass with a preferred mass around uh, 100 uh, GeV. So this dark, this particles don't exist in the standard model, so they cannot be accommodated in the standard model. However, these particles should be weakly interacting. They should have a mass around 100 GeV, so nothing that is too mysterious for us to put in, uh, in gauge theories. And there are several extensions that contain uh, credible dark matter candidates, like uh, supersymmetry, universal extra dimension, and little Higgs, just to give you a few, few buzzwords to see that they uh, require extension of the standard model, but in no means an extension of our paradigm how to describe particle physics. Things is much worse for the dark energy. There is no way to put dark energy into the standard model. The, uh, so the agreement at the loop level shows that the standard model is more than an effective theory, so there has to be something behind it. But now if you take, for example, in the Higgs vacuum expectation value is also a sort of dark energy. But if you take this series as a dark energy, this thing is a little bit too large by a factor of 10 to the 62. So this means that uh, we have absolutely no idea how this sort of dark energy can be described in a theory as we, are, uh, as we have it for, uh, for the standard model. So we have no idea how to put it into the standard model, but uh, also no idea how to put dark energy into any, uh, into any further theory. Okay, and this leads me to my conclusion. So the standard model describes a vast amount of data with good precision. The neutrino masses may be the first experimental hint beyond the standard model. However, the standard model is unnatural, basically because of the hierarchy problem. Dark matter definitely requires extensions of the standard model. Uh, a new theory then has to contain the standard model as a low energy approximation because it describes the data so well so you cannot just throw it away. You have to have a model from which you, uh, from which the standard model follows as a low energy approximation. But uh, then on the other hand, uh, dark energy gives a hint that something is uh, fundamentally ununderstood in our description of subatomic physics. Okay, thank you.